Last year I unboxed and reviewed the Nubia Red Magic 3 gaming phone and basically concluded with this. It was really good value hardware with unique but mediocre software. And this is the next generation, or actually a couple generations down the road there was a 3S. The Red Magic 5G, a 5G capable smartphone with the Snapdragon 865, the first 144 hertz display on a smartphone, an in-screen fingerprint sensor, and a 64 megapixel camera, all for 600 bucks. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and this is the Red Magic 5G. Is it as good as the specs would make you think? And could it even be worth buying? <laughs> So first things first, I was sent this phone for free by Nubia. That said, this is not a paid review and I won't be holding back in any way just because they sent me this phone for free. The Red Magic 5G has its issues, to be sure. But holy cow, is there ever some real value here? We're getting top of the line specs for a fraction of the cost of its competitors. For perspective here, this phone costs 600 bucks. That's it. The OnePlus 8 starts at 700 bucks. Both phones have pretty similar specs. I'd say the OnePlus pulls ahead for me personally due to the software as well as the overall premium nature. The Red Magic at its core is a gaming phone, and so it's definitely a lot more niche than the OnePlus. But if you're someone who takes mobile gaming very seriously, which is totally fair by the way now, considering how many great smartphone mobile games there are, then the Red Magic is definitely worth looking into. But let's look at the design of the Red Magic, because it definitely stands out. We have a glossy glass back that actually is curved. It's comfortable to hold and looks cool, quite premium, and I like it better than the slippery aluminum we got last year. This definitely has the kind of gamer aesthetic I'm not personally a fan of, but if it's your thing, that's totally cool. It's very unique at least. And there's some different colors as well. I have the plain black one, but there's this interesting red and blue color. So that would definitely make you stand out in a crowd. We have USB-C of course, as well as a headphone jack, believe it or not. I know, a 2020 smartphone with a headphone jack. The words seem foreign to me too, but it's true here. That's great because if you're buying a gaming phone, you probably want to have some good audio. And right now wired headphones are still the best way to do that. We also have a couple touch bumpers like this right here. So that's kind of cool. Um, for certain games, this would be useful. Uh, it's just kind of unique to have them there. So uh, I thought that was worth mentioning. The front of the phone is fairly unimpressive at first glance. We have fairly thick bezels, though the screen is rounded, which makes it look a bit more modern. But it is a 1080p OLED panel that has a refresh rate of 144 hertz. Not 120, but 144. As far as I know, this is the first smartphone to have 144 hertz. So that's an impressive accomplishment. Obviously, the difference from 120 to 144 is extremely minimal, but it's still neat. And using this phone feels fantastic thanks to those extra frames. By default, the phone is set to 90 hertz to preserve battery life, and that alone over 60 hertz is so much better. I did turn it up to 144 and found battery life to be fairly decent still, so there's that. And you'd expect the battery to be decent still, considering it's 4,500 milliamp hours, which is pretty big. This phone should easily get you through the typical day, and I'd imagine it'll hold up pretty well for gaming sessions as well. Back to the display. The overall quality isn't amazing, certainly not Samsung level. And besides the polish of software, this is where the OnePlus really pulls ahead. But it's good enough, and the 144Hz is so buttery smooth, I'm totally okay with only 1080p here. If we want a game without 144Hz, we can switch to gaming mode by flipping this red switch on the side. If we do that, we get a cool animation and a list of our games. You can add games to that list, and uh, yeah, right now the amount of games that support a frame rate this high is fairly low. I will say even 60fps games are enjoyable on here, because while they are locked to 60fps, they still perform really well, so you know, you don't typically have frame drops and stuff like that. I do wish more games could take better advantage of the display, and I'd imagine that we'll see more games adapt to that as time goes on, but at the moment there aren't a ton out there. Games that can actually hit higher frame rates, such as Hill Climb 2 here, look fantastic, even if it is a pretty basic 2D platformer. It's hard to see the difference 144Hz makes on camera, but trust me when I say it's huge. Minecraft here is also really nice to play, it's just so smooth. If you're gaming on mobile instead of PC or console, I'd say you want at least 90Hz on your smartphone. The overall gaming experience, as you'd expect, is fantastic, and that high refresh rate display really helps it stand out. The design is kind of odd, but ultimately forgettable. The hardware is impressive, but not a system seller. The headphone jack is a terrific inclusion, but not the biggest reason most people would buy a phone. It comes down to that 144 hertz. It just can't be beat for 600 bucks. The Razer Phone 2 is fairly cheap now and can do 120 hertz, but the screen is LCD instead of OLED and won't look nearly as nice. It also doesn't have the crazy cooling things we have with this phone. There's like internal fans and stuff. It is definitely a bit overkill. Let's look at what we get with the 
camera here. That 64 megapixel number stands out because, well, frankly, it's kind of absurdly high. There's a reason most smartphones are still 12 megapixels. It's because that's about all you can do with these small sensors before you're no longer improving the quality. 64 megapixels is impressive, and this phone can take some nice photos, as you see here, but don't let the numbers fool you into thinking it's better than it is. The software side of the camera also isn't great, and I got some really weird color balance issues in some photos, where all the colors are way more saturated than in real life. We do have a couple other lenses on the phone, an 8 megapixel ultra wide and a 2 megapixel macro lens. Weird combination and neither produce particularly great photos. Video can be filmed in up to 8K at 30 frames per second, which is very impressive considering last year it was stuck at 15 frames per second, so this actually doesn't look too bad. I guess it's cool to have, but uh, not necessary at all. The selfie camera here is 8 megapixels and does a fine job, although the beauty mode was on by default, which I always find annoying. When it comes down to it, let's be real, no one's buying this phone for the camera. I appreciate Nubia trying new things with the 64 megapixels and, you know, 8K, but I think they know it isn't the main draw of this phone. The software also isn't the main draw. Chinese phones often have a reputation for being, well, not great software-wise, and unfortunately that's somewhat true here. On the surface, it works, it's fast and functional, but it does look suspiciously close to iOS. Look at the icons and then check out the settings app. This is Android 10, it's just the Red Magic skin, so we are completely up to date right now, and we get dark mode, which is great, but I wouldn't expect this phone to get past Android 10, so if you're someone who wants consistent updates, uh, Nubia phones probably aren't a good idea. The skin isn't the only iOS similarity. We also don't have a home button. Instead, we have this home bar. Seem familiar? I know a lot of Android phones are using some form of this gesture navigation now, but none are implementing it nearly as well as Apple, and that's the case here. It's fine. It does the job. I can live with some of the typical cheap Android quirks, but I'm not a fan of all the typos in the software. I think I love this bubble that pops up the most, but let's talk about what prompted this pop-up, the in-screen fingerprint sensor. I was actually really excited to try it out because this is my first phone I've gotten with it, and well, I was having some issues registering my thumb, it just wouldn't do it. I removed the pre-installed screen protector and then was able to get in, but it's terribly inconsistent when I unlock the phone. If I don't have my thumb at the angle I originally scanned it with, it just doesn't work. The hardware here is cool, but I do think it really needs to be tweaked, and maybe some of that might come in software updates, but at the moment, uh, the fingerprint sensor is really not that good. I will say it is an improvement over the Red Magic 3. That thing had a very small fingerprint sensor, and it was also very unreliable, so I guess progress. The overall feel of the phone isn't very premium. Haptics aren't that good. Better than last year, but still not that good. The software can be a bit buggy, and the typos are distracting. I would say for you to get this phone, you definitely need to be a more expert side tech user. You need to be willing to potentially have to find some workarounds and tweak your phone a bit to get it working right. This is a stacked phone with some rough edges, but if you fall into the niche of actively wanting a gaming phone, then the Red Magic 5G might be just for you. If you're willing to make some compromises here and there, I think the Red Magic 5G is ultimately amazing value for what you get, and so I wouldn't blame you whatsoever for considering buying it. But with that, I think I'm pretty much done here. What do you think of the Red Magic 5G? Is it a phone you would consider buying, or is it something you'd rather just kind of watch about on YouTube? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks to Nubia for sending the phone out to me. Uh, I really enjoyed looking at it. Again, this video wasn't sponsored, but I do appreciate them reaching out to me. If you found this video interesting or even helpful, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore tech if you'd like to for some reason. With that all being said, thank you so much for watching. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.